How many of you guys know what this is? You can say it out loud if you know what it is. Yes. Uh, next uh, slide. This might jog your memory a little bit. Yes. My girls and I have recently been reading Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And this is an everlasting gobstopper, which is mentioned in the book, although it's not quite as important in the book as it is in uh, the Gene Wilder film. Uh, if you recall, uh, kind of the magic of the everlasting gobstopper was that uh, not only did it change colors and change flavors, but no matter how long you had it in your mouth, it never got any smaller and it never disappeared. It was basically candy that lasted forever, right? Everlasting. Uh, Mr. Wonka was kind enough to invent that for the kids who uh, did not have a lot of pocket money, as he says in the book. Now, I trust that we can all understand the appeal of this, right? Even though it's imaginary, you know, candy, a nice piece of candy is something that uh, only lasts for so long and then it's gone. Uh, a memory that, you know, soon gets replaced with another memory. But candy that lasts forever, I think, yes, please, we could, uh, we could line up behind that. Now, I, I think, uh, judging by the look on some of your faces, you're probably wondering where I'm going with this. And uh, I actually kind of like seeing that look this early. I get a little anxious if I see that look like halfway through or three quarters of the way through. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we are continuing our study in John chapter 15 this morning. Uh, it's essentially uh, actually a part two to the message that we had last week. Uh, as in, you know, we almost could have ended last week with to be continued and then uh, picked up here today. And that was uh, looking at the first seven verses of John chapter 15, which kind of is that famous passage where Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches, right? He says, uh, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. And Jesus was using this really powerful metaphor to teach his disciples, right? This picture of uh, a branch being connected to a vine and the result of that was uh, the vine bears fruit. And so this week, we're going to look at another thing that Jesus says about the fruit in verse 16. Uh, Jesus says, I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. Uh, or as the NIV puts it, uh, fruit that will last, a lasting fruit. In other words, uh, everlasting gobstopper type of fruit, right? Right? Uh, the, the healthy fruit that we want to be growing in our lives uh, as we follow Jesus. And so that's kind of going to be the focus of our time this morning. And so I want to begin just by reading the passage, and then uh, we'll, we'll move on from there. So it's John chapter 15. We're going to start in verse 9. Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Amen. So last week we examined some of the truths of John chapter 15. Uh, this week I want to focus on sort of asking and answering just one question. Uh, that kind of fits in with that. And that question is, uh, is my life and your life producing this kind of good fruit that Jesus is talking about? In other words, is your life producing fruit that will last, fruit that abides? In terms of our spiritual life, as followers of Jesus uh, connected to him like branches to a vine, is there going to be a lasting, durable, eternal result or fruit because of how we are today using our time and our energy and our resources. And I think we want that to be true. I think, I think we want to be part of something going on that's bigger than us, right? We want that fruit that grows in us 
to outlast the short years that we have to walk on this earth. I think that's true whether you're 13 or whether you're 90. And so to that end, I, I do think it's, it's okay to keep it simple this morning, right? Uh, a kind of a quick recap of last week's teaching and, and then talking about this fruit, uh, fruit that lasts and fruit that doesn't. And also in, in this passage, we have the key for having this uh, sort of everlasting gobstopper type of fruit that we want to get from Jesus. So as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, this is really sort of building on last week's message. Uh, This section of the Gospel of John is an extended teaching that is uh, usually called the Upper Room Discourse. And and it was a a teaching that he gave to his closest friends between the Last Supper and his arrest. The first part of this teaching we find in John 14, and it really is, is focused on comforting to the disciples. Jesus was leaving, and he told them, and they were really anxious about it because Jesus leaving was not part of their plans or their expectations. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Uh, This really was sort of turning their world upside down. But Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, the helper, who would come to them and guide them and teach them. Jesus also promised that he himself would come back which short-term fulfillment, he came back after the resurrection, but long-term, he is going to come again uh, on the last day. Now, chapter 14 ended with an interesting note. Jesus said, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, verse 31, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. And that's sort of a a little bit of a a break point. Sometimes... uh, Commentators look at uh, this upper room discourse as a part A, part B, and uh, while it, and so some of these things we talked about a couple years ago, a couple, not a couple years ago, a couple weeks ago. Uh, some of it uh, we'll we'll wade into today. So one of the things that we did talk about in relation to this uh, verse thirty and the ruler of this world is that. While it is true that God is sovereign over every molecule and atom in the universe, what we find in the Bible is that there are forces, both physical and spiritual, who oppose God's will and his purposes for his creation. God has enemies. And in this age, which is kind of now until Jesus comes back, we find that uh, God's enemies do have some power, and they try to use that to interfere with his plan. Notice I, had, I said try. Now, I say this uh, really just to bring our attention to the very last phrase of that chapter, where Jesus says, rise, let us go from here. So that is where chapter 14 ends, 15 begins, and Jesus' emphasis is shifting from comforting the disciples in chapter 14 to really laying out the future mission that he was going to give them. So one commentator, uh, C.H. Dodd, puts it like this. He points out uh, that the normal Greek usage of this phrase, rise, let us go from here, uh, really has this implication of let us go to meet an advancing enemy. It's kind of like a call to arms. Uh, Theologian Leslie Newbegin adds uh, this. uh, He says, the gracious indwelling of God with his people, which uh, we we read about in, in John chapter 14 of the Holy Spirit coming, Uh, So the indwelling of God and his people is not an invitation to settle down and forget the rest of the world. It is a summon to mission. For the Lord who dwells with his people is the one who goes before them in the pillar of fire and cloud. You know, one of the things that I I shared last week was that I think we have maybe a little bit of a tendency to miss uh, things in this passage, this vine and the branches passage. Um, Maybe... I mean, maybe it's just me, but I, I think it's easy for us to read this as very sort of uh, maybe individual or kind of me-centered, like this is how I grow in my faith. And while that's not exactly wrong, it's not exactly the whole truth of what's going on. You see, John chapter 15 is Jesus preparing his disciples and those disciples that would come after those disciples but he's preparing them to carry on his mission, to sort of pick up the baton and run with it. And so really the center of gravity of this section of scripture is not individualistic, but it is missional. And so I think if we grab hold of that truth, 
that is the kind of the first step to 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 uh, bearing fruit that will last. Now, uh, I will say next week the passage we're going to get into uh, will actually see more of the opposition to Jesus' mission uh, in uh, how the world reacts to Jesus' people going out. But uh, real, a quick note on bearing fruit. Uh, again, last week mentioned that you know this idea of bearing fruit could really be described as God's kingdom being increasingly realized in our lives. Now, if we are indeed connected to Jesus, our lives will be more about his kingdom and his priorities than our own. Bearing fruit, then, sort of encompasses uh, everything in the life of a follower of Jesus that brings God glory, right? Uh, So yes, it does mean sharing the gospel and bringing new people into the kingdom. Yes, it does mean godly character being formed in us, Right, seeing those fruit, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Yes, it does mean uh, uh, our obedience to Jesus' commands. It means loving one another. It, it means experiencing the love and the joy and the peace of Jesus in our lives. It's all of those things. But so often I think we miss the boat when we begin to think that it's more speaking to our own personal experience um, rather than the bigger mission of Jesus. You know, um, when we kind of get locked into uh, something, just thinking it's, it's really just about me, and um, I think that's fruit that spoils quickly, right? That's candy that sort of dissolves uh, in, in moments and is not lasting. And so, uh, so really what we're talking about this morning is fruit that lasts and fruit that doesn't. One of the hard truths that we looked at last week was that not all fruit is equal, right? Not all fruit is the result of the true vine that is Jesus. Remember verse 5, Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For, Jesus says, apart from me you can do nothing. Nothing. So fruit grown in the life of a follower of Jesus through his connection, his or her connection to Jesus, uh, that type of fruit that is according to uh, Jesus' plan and Jesus' mission, that is eternal and it is everlasting. Apart from him, nothing we do will last. Nothing. And so what kind of fruit are we after? And I, I mean, that's part of the question this morning. What, what, are we, what are we hoping for? What are we pursuing? What are we giving our, our time and our talent and our treasure to? Because, you know, the fruit that lasts, at least in my experience, can take a long time to grow. Often it grows slowly. And yet, really, I'm, uh, I'm speaking for myself, but probably most of us here, we really like quick fixes. Like, really like quick, quick, quick fixes, quick stuff. Instant gratification. And so, uh, the fruit we often choose to chase after, the fruit that catches our eye, is of that variety. And usually it's pretty fleeting and pretty self-centered. Verse 16, Jesus says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, should be everlasting, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. You know that if you are a follower of Jesus, you have been chosen by the Lord individually, but he has chosen you and sent you to carry on his mission. This mission that he is talking about, that he's getting ready to send the 12 out 2,000 years ago, that same mission he has chosen you to carry out. And I think that's a weight that we should feel maybe a little more often than we do. And again, speaking for myself, first of all, but even thinking about this week, as, as, as we walk through our office or school or home, as we walk through a restaurant, do we, do we feel the weight of that? I mean, I don't know how many times I've you know, walked away from an interaction with somebody and, and you know, thought, oh, I, I could have said, you know, I, I could have said, said more, I could have said something. What kind of fruit are we after? What do we want to be the thing 
about us that outlives us? Right? This can be a helpful question to ask yourself when you have a few minutes of quiet time to listen uh, for the voice of the Lord. What do you want to be remembered for? Is it a business you built or uh, maybe a, a company you ran? Maybe it's an accomplishment or award. Maybe something really, uh, really great uh, you've accomplished in, in athletics. Or maybe it's family. Um, maybe you want to be remembered for having just a, a, a really picture-perfect family. Maybe even church. You know, maybe you want to be remembered as, as the person who's read the Bible cover to cover 36 times. Maybe led, led, uh, led meetings with hundreds of uh, fellow believers. Now, of course, these aren't bad things. None, none of those are bad. Those are good things. And I think those things are worthy of our time if the Lord has put those in our path. You know, we, we do believe the Lord plants us in certain places, right? In that business, in that sport, in that family, that neighborhood, this church. But we always need to make sure that we don't veer off course because... We do a lot, right? Am I doing these things for the lasting fruit that is in service to God's kingdom and his mission, or am I doing it maybe partially for me because it makes me feel good or um, because I think it might make my life a little better or easier, because I, maybe because I want to be remembered for something? You know, C.S. Lewis had a great quote. Uh, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. Friends, if we try to bear fruit on our own, based on our own sort of wants and needs and desires, eventually we always will be let down by that. Always be left wanting and always be unfulfilled. Because our focus kind of veered off to earthly things. But if, if we aim to please God and we aim to respond to the love that he has shown us and we're, we're aiming to grow closer to him, obviously we don't do any of that perfectly, but you know, we, we can aim that way. If we're, if we're aiming to grow closer with him like, like a vine and a, into a branch, then in this life we will know peace and joy and love. Aim at heaven, and you'll get earth thrown in. Now, I know that some of you guys here today are struggling. Uh, maybe just struggling with where you're at in life. Maybe a particular thing that's challenging. Any number of things. And so, if that's you uh, this morning, just... I, I, I'd ask uh, you to listen to this next part. Now, if you pray through this question, Lord, am I too focused on earthly things? You know, what people think, maybe what my bank account or my 401k is doing, what my family did or didn't do, why I'm not as, why I'm not, uh, as talented or my talent is not acknowledged as much as other people why I, I don't get uh, attention from a certain place. Um, if you ask Jesus this question and you feel that gentle voice say, yes, you are too focused on those things, don't be discouraged. I mean, listen, but don't be discouraged. Don't beat yourself up. And you know why? Because you wouldn't feel that way if he didn't care about you. If he didn't love you enough to make you discontent, right? If you didn't feel like something was missing or something was off, that feeling uh, is conviction, which is, you know, Christian conviction, we don't talk about a whole lot uh, in the positive, but it really is a gift from the Lord. And it's totally different than feeling guilty about something, and it's totally different than feeling ashamed about something. You know, conviction, it really is sort of that gentle and really a sweet word from the Lord that because you are his child, 
who he loves dearly, there is an area of your life that he wants to change in you. Right? He needs to change. You know, he doesn't ask us to change on our own and come back and check in with him later. Verse 9, uh, Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so I, so have I loved you. Which is really kind of a mind-blowing thing to think about. You know, if, you, if you've been tracking with us on this story through John and Jesus' relationship with his Father... As the Father has loved me, Jesus said, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Remain in my love. Live in my love. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And so really this is the key to the whole thing, which is love. Love is the key. You know, the greatest commandment of Jesus, which is the focus here, is his instruction to love one another. We see this uh, right in verse 12. He, Jesus again says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Love is the key to obedience, which also makes it the key to bearing this kind of fruit that lasts that we've been talking about. The everlasting gobstopper type fruit that's wonderful and lasts forever. You know, this... Uh, this uh, idea, this love, uh, love being the key, I think, made such an impression on John, Jesus' friend, uh, that it's believed many years after John wrote this gospel, um, he wrote an epistle, which is a letter called First John. It was a letter to a church from, uh, at this point in his life, a very old, faithful, loving pastor. And really, there's this theme of love and loving one another uh, because God loved us. And it runs all throughout uh, this book. And I would actually say, if you want a little extra credit, and I say extra credit, but I'm not going to check, you should read 1 John this week. It's a short book. It's not very long. um, And, you know, if, if, if you want, maybe even every morning this week, if you have the time, read through 1 John especially in light of what, we're, uh, what we've been looking at in John uh, chapter 15 here. But I think what we, what we see is that love, love motivates and powers uh, the, the mission that Jesus has given us, right? Um, the mission that Jesus have, has really uh, to make God known to the world. You know, in a sense, you could say that the followers of Jesus are, are really animated by his love, even like governed by his love. You know, the word love appears uh, 57 times in the Gospel of John, which is more often than the other three Gospels combined. And additionally, in that first, uh, in the book of 1 John, it's another 46 times. Uh, Which means I should probably make an important note here that, you know, Jesus does not love us because we are obedient, right? But our, our obedience is the way that we respond to the love that he has shown us. And when we get that backwards, which we often do and we will continue to do, we get, we get lost and we get disoriented really easily. In light of what we've been talking about, um, listen to, the, to these words from the Apostle Paul. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, which is a very well-known writing about love, but maybe we can hear it with a little different ears this morning in light of what we're talking about. Paul writes, If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And if I give away all I have and I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. You know, most of us would feel completely inadequate as a follower of Jesus if we're standing next to somebody who can uh, speak like an angel and has the gift of prophecy and has faith that can make a mountain move, right? Let alone somebody like who just gave away all their money to the poor and are, they're willing to die right then and there for their faith in Jesus. Like, I think most of us would feel like, 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 there's just no way we can measure up to that. And yet, if all of that was not the result of God's love flowing through that person, 
right? If all of that was not the result of that person being connected to Jesus, like a branch is connected to the vine, then that's not lasting fruit. Paul says, without love, you gain nothing. All of that would gain nothing, which is another one of those just kind of mind-blowing things. And then notice what he uh, says, he goes on, Paul says, to write about, about love sort of in the positive, right? This is sort of a sketch of what love looks like, the kind of love of people who the Father has pruned and he has tended to in order that they will bear fruit that will last forever. He says, love is patient and kind. Maybe your faith can move a mountain, but maybe it's hard to be patient and kind. Like I said a minute ago, we are sort of trained to want everything instantly right away. Our microwaves aren't even fast enough. (laughs) Which is a funny problem, but not as funny when it's when it's people that get in our way, right? How many times do we fail to be patient and kind with people? Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. Social media makes that difficult. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. I think too many of us go through seasons of our life where we carry resentment around like a backpack. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Man, is anything harder in our culture right now? Not to rejoice in wrongdoing and celebrating the truth? Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. And this love is really personified for us in Jesus' death on the cross. Right, The fact that we need his love to, in us to accomplish these things, um, to bear fruit, really sort of highlights the fact that there's nowhere else where we can actually find that type of love. Right? We, we cannot love. Sin makes us selfish. And before the Lord found us, we were all spiritually dead in our sin. Ephesians 2 Verse 4, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. My friends, don't miss uh, an opportunity to respond to God's love today. And that's going to probably be a little different for each one of us. Um, Have you believed in Jesus? Like, put your faith and trust in him. I mean, if you haven't, maybe that's the question this morning. What's stopping you? I might mention, too, if you're here uh, this morning thinking through that, he might be trying to tell you something. Maybe you're here and you've believed in Jesus for many years, but I think like so many of our relationships, maybe you've been taking him for granted a little bit, taking that love of his for granted. Maybe, uh, maybe you're here this morning and you've sort of got that obedience question backwards. You know, maybe at the start, at the beginning, you were really uh, uh, studying and and seeking out uh, to understand his commandments and obey them because you really realized and felt how much he loved you. But lately, maybe you're you're trying to obey these things uh, in order to feel more loved. Back to Ephesians 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, 
not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's how we bear the fruit that's going to last, is we walk uh, according to all the things that he's prepared for us beforehand. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that you have given us this morning. And Lord, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that, um, Lord, you required, uh, you required nothing of us in order to receive your love. And so, Lord, I, I pray for each person here today. Lord, you know where every, uh, every heart is at. You know where uh, every uh, anxiety is lurking. Lord, you know uh, the things that uh, make us uh, resentful or hurt. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would, uh, you would pour your light and your love and your peace into your people this morning. Lord, that you would meet each and every one of us where we are at. Lord, those who might be here this morning who are seeking or just... Uh, Lord, asking the question. Lord, I I pray that you would would answer those questions. Lord, for those of us who who maybe get, get stuck in a little bit of a rut in our faith, Lord, would you please shake us out of that? Father, as 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 the vine dresser, uh, the gardener, the one who tends the branches, we, um, Lord, we submit to the pruning that you need to do in our lives, so that we can bear more fruit, so that we can, Lord, participate in the work that you have set out before us. Lord, we desire to see your kingdom uh, grow and expand. We des- desire to see more people brought in. But Lord, that's your work, and so we pray that you would do it. Lord, convict us of the areas that, Lord, we need to surrender, we need to let go, the areas we need to change, the areas we need to let you come in and change. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.